Greetings, folks. Scott Galbraith here, also known as The Great Scott, and welcome once again to The Great Scott's Roundtable. And today we have a very fun show for you. I want to read you something. As you can see, I have this card here. What does the card say? Well, let me tell you. I promise to pray for you every day, ask your forgiveness, grant you the same, and be your friend always. This is the grace card. Now, what is the grace card, you ask? Well, in addition to being a great piece of writing, it is also a film a 2011 film, a film that I actually had never heard of until the day I saw it. It was actually kind of an interesting, it was kind of interesting the way that it happened. My friend from church, Dave McCreary and I were both big fans of all the films that Sher Sherwood Baptist had made. And one day on a Friday, he calls me out of the blue and says, hey, Scott, are you going to the uh, screening of the Christian film at Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy? And I'm like, I didn't know there was one. But I said, yeah, I'll be there. Little did I know that the director of the film, his wife, the executive producer, and one of the stars were all going to be there. And that was the first time that I met some of them and the very first time I saw the grace card. And tonight I am very pleased to announce that we have a reunion of not only that director that I met, but also five members of the cast. Hi everybody, how are y'all doing tonight? Hi, doing great. great, thank you. Thank you all for being here, thank you. Oh. Well, I will introduce you all one at a time. First of all, we have a actor with more than 60 IMDb credits to his name. He is known in the Christian comedy circuit as God's Smart Alec, and he played the role of Bill Mac McDonald in The Grace Card. Please say hello to Michael Joyner. How are you doing, sir? And that response sounds like my last comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, very nice, very nice. Yeah. By the way, Michael was also the very first guest on my very first round table, and this is the first time he's back. So thank you once again for coming back, Michael. Great. Next up, we have an actor with 12 IMDb credits to his name. He is also a hip hop artist, and he plays Pastor Sergeant Sam Wright in the Grace Card. Please welcome to the Great Scots Round Table, Mr. Michael Higginbottom. How are you, sir? Doing well, doing well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to yeah, have you. Sounds here. like Michael Jordan's last comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> very nice. Now, one of the things <laughs> that makes the Grace Card truly amazing <laughs> is the fact that, with the exception of the two gentlemen that I introduced and Oscar winner Lou Gossett Jr., the majority of the cast were acting for the first time. But you would never know this to watch the film. And we have some of those first-time actors here. First of all, we have a gentleman who apparently no digital platform can seem to keep straight where he is supposed to be in the credits. If you look at the movie On Demand, he has billing over Michael and Michael. If you look on Amazon Prime, he is listed <laughs> as Paul Moore and playing Lieutenant B Biggs. And he plays the police lieutenant who basically sets the entire movie in motion, Bob Childress, by teaming together Sergeant Pastor Sam Wright and uh, and uh, Officer Mack. Please say hello to Chris Thomas. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you very much for doing this, Scott. And uh, no just, problem. Uh, Thank you for I'm being honored. here. I'm honored, to, honored to be here. Thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to have you. It's an honor to have you. All right, next up, one of the major plot points of the Grace Card is, of course, Officer Mack's relationship with his son. And we have the actor here who played uh, Mack's troubled uh, son, Blake McDonald. Uh, please say hello to Rob Erickson. How are you, Rob? Doing fine. Thanks for having me, Scott. No problem. Thank you very, thank you very much for being there. Sorry, I was a little late on my video pinning of you. Thanks for joining us. Okay, and then we have, as we know in the movie, there um, Mac's wife, who sadly the actress who played Mac's wife couldn't be here. She wanted to, but she had a last minute scheduling conflict. But she spends the majority of the film uh, trying to get Mac to go to therapy, but she eventually um, gets um, Blake to go. And we have the actress here who played uh, Dr. Okay, this is embarrassing. I'm having trouble reading my own writing. Uh, was it Dr. Va Dr. Vine? Dr. Vines. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Vine. She also went on to act in the movie Indivisible as well. Please say hello to Cindy Holmes Hodges. How are you doing, Cindy? Hey, fine. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Good and I wanted, I, it's great to be here. I actually talked to you just yesterday. You were you were a last minute addition. So thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. And you have Rob to thank. R Rob was one of the, was the person who recommended that I reach out to you. So. Yay. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> right. Oh, no problem. And last but certainly not least, we have the gentleman who there would be no grace card without. This gentleman uh, created the story. He was the producer and the director of the film. He went on to direct the feature film Indivisible. Please say hello to Dr. David Evans. How are you doing, sir? Hello, everybody. <laughs> and as an eye doctor, it's my place to point out that 
many people on the on the uh, round table here today were not wearing reading glasses 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. So I can see everyone's face clearly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I even wear glasses. I just don't wear them when I'm doing the round table here. But anyway, <laughs> nice to have you all here. The funny thing is, I probably should mention this right <laughs> off the bat here real quickly. This is actually not the first Grace Card reunion I have orchestrated, believe it or not. Uh, last, um, a couple months ago, I got three or four of my friends together to watch the movie. And I thought it would be a great surprise if I could get one of the actors afterwards to do a Q&A on Skype. So I reached out to both Michael Joyner and Michael Higginbottom. And to my, in the hopes that I would get one of them, I surprisingly got them both. And uh, they actually were on Skype together and we had a great time. They made me look very good in front of my friends. So thank you both for doing that, gentlemen. Also, uh, I, ma I managed to mention uh, to my friends that uh, Michael Joyner was a comedian and Michael Higginbottom had done some hip hop and I kind of both put them on the spot to do their perspective uh, skills. Wanna let you guys know, none of that will be happening here today, okay? There will be no, there will be no, call for improv for improv to stand up or hip hop here today. I just want to thank you guys for being here. All right, let's uh, jump right into it here because what I'd like to do is I'd really like to talk about because it goes without saying that this was uh, one of my favorite Christian movies ever. The weird thing is, is that the year before it came out, I was actually talking to a friend of mine and I said, being somebody who has liked pretty much every procedural crime drama that's on television, I said, you know, it, I said to a friend of mine, you know, it wouldn't even have to be action packed, but Police officers are Christians, too. I wish somebody would make a decent faith-based film about police officers. Very next year, both you guys and Courageous come out. It was just kind of interesting timing. So what I would like to ask, what I'd like to start off with here is every idea has an origin or a genesis, if you will. Uh, so, David, I would like you to start by basically telling our viewers, how did the Grace Card start? Where did where'd the idea come from? How did you guys decide to make the movie? Yes, so we had been uh, doing a, a passion play, a live passion play, for around 15 years in our church in Memphis. <clears throat> it's recorded over uh, Memphis. And uh, we, we all went as a group to see the movie Fireproof. Uh, and that night I turned to my wife and several others from our church, Calvary Church here in uh, Cordova, Tennessee, just said, hey, I think this is what God's been preparing us for, uh, to make a movie. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long after that that God put the story of the grace card in my heart. I have a patient named, his first name Sam, an African-American pastor here in Memphis who's also a police officer. And we would talk a lot about his uh, conflicts he would have with his, his white uh, partners on the force and the struggles also that he, or conflicts that he had with other officers that knew he was a pastor. And I thought, wow, that's something to, to start with. And then we just, uh, began to incorporate those other elements of the things that happened in the storyline that we won't get too in depth with here since many people who hopefully will watch this have never seen the movie. So um, that's kind of how it started. And uh, we brought in Howie Klausner who wrote Space Cowboys, a, a good friend of all of ours. And uh, he did a great job fine tuning the script and Lou Gossett joined and, and lots of miracles after that. But so proud all the people that are here with us tonight who were just all in this together. A lot of us, many of us didn't know what we were doing, but we learned from one another and God anointed the project. And, and uh, I think there's lots of folks like you, Scott, who are big fans of the movie around the world. It's been seen in over 50 countries and whoever imagined uh, that so many people would be uh, taught forgiveness through, through a, a project like this, but we could go on and on with stories about things we've heard and the impacts that the film has had, but Again, just so glad that, that God moved through this project and that and all these folks here today were, were part of it. Something I'll never forget. Mm. Yeah. If someone had told me back when I was watching this at Eastern Nazarene College where I first met you and uh, Michael Higginbottom, I never would have believed that I would have been doing something like this one day. So this is, this is kind of surreal for me. Now, what I'd like the actors to do now, this is one of the reasons people have asked me, why do you call this the round table? It's because I basically ask one question and then everybody goes around answering it. What I'd like to all the actors now to do is basically uh, tell our viewers how they got involved in the film. And because he got uh, top billing in the movie, we're going to have Joyner go first. Joyner, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> hey, I did want to say one thing. What's that? Uh, now, I know when you, you were talking mostly about film credits, but I believe Cindy has an extensive theater background. Don't you, Cindy? I do. I, and Which I was, is what yeah. I was told. 
Yeah. I do. I, I've acted in theater, just not film before. So okay. the film process was very new to me. Yeah. yeah. It really showed quite a bit in her performance. So a um, lot. A lot. Thanks, you guys. Uh, Thank you. Seriously. Uh, so the question is, what was it again? Question was, I just want everybody to tell how they got involved in the projects. I had just moved back from Los Angeles after going there to study acting more seriously and to, uh, you know, I felt God's move to move there. And then when I came back home after uh, the economy collapsed, I thought my career was over. But then as I prayed about it, I felt God saying to be ready, you know. So I continued to study my exercises and everything. And then uh, David or, how, or somebody told David, this might be the perfect jerk you need for the lead role. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that on the on the behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I was praying for a jerk to direct me, so it worked out perfectly. But um, <laughs> oh, laugh on that? No, no, that was good. But laughing, okay. Well, anyway, uh, I got to admit, the only time, at that time, faith-based films didn't have a great reputation, but I, I took it to the health club and started reading it, and there was such an anointing. I had to put my sunglasses on like I have now, and because I was in tears, just almost involuntarily, and I said, uh, man, Lord, this is, uh, this, I could play this role. I feel, I'm really feeling this. It's a great story, very powerful, and so, uh, you know, we, we signed the contract. I mean, there's a lot in between stuff, but then I found out Howie Klausner wrote it, who I, I didn't realize that. And um, luckily they they got Louis Gossett Jr. after me because I wouldn't have been able to hide my desperation to be in that movie if I would have saw <laughs> that he was in it before me. So I, it's, it's one of those films, I believe God works on all Christian films one way or the other, but I've never seen things fall into place so perfectly and in such a miraculous way. And, you know, even when I saw Mike, I, I, I imagined a very timid, uh, small, a kind of guy that Matt could easily pick on. And I wasn't sure. But then the more I got to know Mike, I said, man, this, this is brilliant casting, you know. And everything was really just God ordained, in my opinion. So, you know, that's the short end. That's the short story of it. But it, it was uh, an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Michael Hickenbottom, what about you? This is actually a question I think I've asked you before when we did the uh, Skype session, but I would like our view. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I was with a talent agency back in Memphis called the Lisa Lacks Agency. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I'd done one other feature film before then. They cut my part out of pretty much. <laughs> and I've done, you know, some theater and things locally. And I remember the day that, Lisa called me, it was last minute. I was actually playing basketball with a friend of mine. And she was like, um, it's a, they're, they're doing the casting call for this movie. It was called, uh, what was the name of it beforehand, David? Uh, uh, the Life Giver. Yeah. It was called The Life Giver. Right. And she said, I want you to come and read for it. And I'm sweaty and it was crazy. So I actually had to bring my friend that was with me playing ball. And, you know, he had acting aspirations too. So we showed up. And I'm looking through the sides, and I'm like, oh, man. You know, it, I'd done some passion plays beforehand, you know, and I didn't really know what to expect. But when I read just the sides alone, I was like, man, this has some meat to it. So um, I went into the, you know, into the room and, and read for it. And I remember David being there and my agent, who was, I guess they had brought on as, as the casting director or whatever was there, and – I read for it and they were like, okay, you know, tell us your background. And they asked me to read another little part. And I remember leaving out and it was, uh, it was uh, a reporter or whatever for the local commercial appeal or whatever. And she was like, oh man, I saw your audition. It was great. You know, let me get some information. And it was probably a couple weeks later. My agent was like, they really like your audition. But then it took months, right? I was like, <laughs> Man, I'm not gonna get it. And then when I found out Sony picked it up first, 
And then I found out after that that they got Louis Gossett Jr. because they were interested in Robert Guillaume at first, right? And I was like, yeah, I like Benson and all, but if they got Lou Gossett, it's, it's a wrap. And they got Lou Gossett. And then they went and I think they auditioned probably about another 30 people. So I'm thinking like, man, they want to get a name person, you know, somebody with maybe more experience. And I remember the day and they called and they didn't tell me I had the part. They said, you know, we want to come down, you know, I want you to come down and we want to talk to you about it. And David was there and he said, man, we have going to Nashville. We went to Atlanta. <laughs> we tried to audition more people. He said, but I knew from the moment we auditioned you that you were the one, you know? He said, I want you to have, I want to offer you the role. That's how I got involved. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, I thought that, uh, okay, so why don't we have uh, Chris, you want to uh, go next? Yes, be one of the only questions I get to answer since I didn't have much of a role in the thing. <laughs> no, I no, I actually. Of course, if people want to see more of your role, they can watch the deleted scenes. You're in two of the deleted scenes. I don't remember that, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I've actually been with another agency here in Memphis since 2001. Been doing videos, uh, training videos, commercials, making millions of dollars. And uh, my mom and sister go to church at Calvary, and so they were telling me about this faith-based film, and they said you sh you should come audition. And so actually, this is very funny, and I don't know if Joyner knows this or not, but I actually read for Max Parts. That's what I read. That was my audition, was reading that. And then to see how that role turned out, there is no way I could have done anything close to the job he did. But um, David felt sorry for me and for my mom and sister and gave me the role of uh, Bob Childers. And I'll tell you, I loved it. And so I was just, it was an incredible experience to get to be with all these people. You look that part perfectly, I'll say that. Well, I did, I did put on weight on purpose and I haven't lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually. <laughs> oh, that's why yeah, they actually, call it a round right. table. You know, that's, that's why it's a round table. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, uh, David, this actually reminds me of something. I knew this. I knew I was going to remember stuff. When you were at, e when you and Michael and your wife and Lynn Holmes were at Eastern Nazarene College, I remember one of the things that you said was, is that you would cast people whose real jobs kind of mirrored their own in order for people. And I know that uh, Chris you used to be, a, you were in public service for a while. So was that one of the reasons why you cast him as like, an authoritative figure like a police lieutenant. Well, his jokes were better than Michael Joyner's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. No, really, you know, I, it's just kind of like, I just look at someone and say, I think they'd be great for this part. And of course, as years have gone on, I've realized how important it is to not just cast people based on the picture that you see of them. <laughs> that's, that's true. When it comes to Michael Joyner, I saw a picture and I saw this guy, like he said, looks like a real jerk. But I, later on, I'll get into one of the greatest memories I have of the movie when we were filming the scene at the end of the film when he when he breaks down. But you know, again, um, but, but Chris is awesome, and he was uh, just a friend I'd had, and like we did with the doctor in the film, uh, the, right. the the surgeon, just someone I knew, and said, God just put them on my heart, said they'd be great in the film, and uh, you know, again. All we can say is God anointed the project because it turned out beautiful in every way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Rob, my how about greatest, you? My greatest memory was when the check finally cashed. Yeah. That was a great memory. Right <laughs> <there>. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, they don't call, it, they they don't call it God smart, Alec, for nothing. Rob, your turn. <laughs> right. Back to you, Rob. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've been attending church at Calvary with David for uh, – a very long time and been involved in the uh, passion play projects they've been he'd been producing for probably 10 years and when in one facet or another and when it was announced to the the church that we were undertaking this uh, project uh, and that there was a part for a young man about my age uh, it just seemed like the thing to, to try out for it. So me and uh, probably 10 or 15 of my, my buddies went out for it. And I mean, I was very excited when I got the call. Well, thank you very much. Now, 
as Michael uh, Joyner just pointed out, uh, Cindy, you had some uh, previous, you had a lot of previous uh, theater experience. So uh, your turn. How did uh, you end? How did you end up as uh, the therapist? Well, uh, David and I had worked together on some passion plays as well for the previous ten years, and so. When the movie came along, I was helping David behind the scenes and um, just with uh, wa watching auditions and being another set of eyes for, to help maybe with casting and uh, especially for some of our church people coming through. Um, long story short, now the film is completely cast and we're days away from the first shoot. Uh, from the first day of shooting. And the actress that was supposed to be in the role of Dr. Vines, last minute, couldn't fulfill that obligation. And we are days away. And so now we're all looking around going, well, who, who, who can we get to fill that role for Dr. Vines? And um, we all decided we'll, we'll just go home and pray about it. God's gonna give us somebody. And that night on the way home, David's wife, Esther, looked at David and said, you know what, David, I think she's sitting right in front of you. Uh, and she was meeting me. <laughs> and I was thankful because I thought, you know, for I was planning on being behind the scenes and, and not do, I hadn't done film, I'd done theater. And, um, and my day-to-day -day schedule wasn't conducive for me being on the set and available for it all the time. And so, but David called and said, would you consider stepping in and being Dr. Vines? And I thought, oh my, I don't know. Let me think about it. Um, yes, no, no, I didn't come that fast. He gave me 24 hours. And so talked it over with my husband and thought about schedule. And I came back to David and I said, you know what? If you can work around my normal day job and get me in at night and in the mornings and all of that, that would be wonderful. I would love to do that. And I will tell you, I was so thankful for it. I was thankful that David and Esther thought about me in that role um, because again, I've done theater, I've done voiceover work, I've done um, some kids television stuff, but I've never done film and it's a completely different genre. It's completely mm -hmm. different. Yeah, and yeah. it was challenging, it was fun, I loved it. I was so thankful for the opportunity. So you were yeah, natural. Was, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Really You're absolutely good. right. I did. I, I was in theater for years. The very first time I was in a film, I was like, wow, this is nothing like, this is nothing like the same. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah. Uh -uh. I also realized I had a annoying habit of looking out of the corner of my eye to see people's reaction. When you're doing theater, that's no problem. That's when you're right. on a set, you can't look at the, you can't look into the camera. That's right. So, yeah. There's a, there's a whole bunch of outtakes on Reconciler of me accidentally looking at the camera. <laughs> so anyway. Anyway, okay, now this next one, this is a similar question to what I asked on my unidentified uh, reunion, which I know you watched recently, Cindy. Uh, yeah. We want to keep this, um, uh, we, we want to keep this spoiler free, so a little pretext here. If the answer to this question is the ending scene, just say the ending scene and don't tell, don't give anything else away. But do you have a favorite scene in the film? This is for everybody. Anybody can jump in here. Well, let me let me jump in because I don't have any other much, much else to say. But no, there are so many incredible scenes, to be honest. But a couple I thought about today was the chapel scene with the two Michaels where mm -hmm. Joyner was crying and the way Sam came. I mean, uh, yeah, Sam, sorry, Higginbottom, I'm getting off that. <laughs> I'll be Sam, that's fun. <laughs> Just that, that emotion that both of them showed for each other was a big deal for me. That really meant a lot. And then real quick, the dinner scene with Rob and Mac and Joy, oh my word. Every yeah. time I watch the movie over and over and I get chills and think yeah. of yeah. the energy it took for both of them or all three of them, I, I'm just amazed. And of course my scene was my favorite, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was great. There's so many great scenes. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Oh, I agree with Chris. Yeah. Um, the chapel, uh, that's funny. I was going to say those two scenes, if you had to pick two. And I'll tell you a little something about those scenes. Did I freeze? Because you guys froze. No, you're not frozen. You're good. We can see, I can see you fine at least. Okay. Um, uh, I did that to my friend once just for the fun of it. 
I froze on, and he thought I froze, but I was just messing with him. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. It's a fun thing. So we, Mike and I knew that scene was going to be the, just incredibly powerful. And as we're practicing it the day before, we've practiced it a few times. And I don't know if Mike remembers what we said. You know what? Let's, let's not mess with this anymore. Because we didn't want to become robo actor. Mm -hmm. Almost in tears. We were in the hospital. Mike was doing his usual thing where he got no sleep because he was going to college, raising a family of 10. I don't know what he was doing, but he had no sleep. So we practiced it twice and we said, hey, man, I think every time we practiced it, like the Lord showed up mm. and it was hitting us. Yeah. You know, you don't ever force a scene like that. You want it to hit you. Right. And every time it hit us. So sure enough, when we went in there and what I really like is David and everyone was such a professional after we did it the first time, David came in so quietly and just said, he knew, he knew there was something special going on. Fantastic. You guys ready to do it again. And I watched that scene because I put it on my reel. Both those scenes, I got to tell you, I look at it and think one of the reasons I looked good as an actor is because Mike did a thing called give and take. He knew when to, he knew when to, he could have done several movements that would have messed me up, but he just let me have that scene. And I look at that and go, man, you don't realize that at the time, but he just mm. let, I mean, he just knew how to just less is more. And then he yeah. knew when to yeah. come in. And then I also look at Rob and that dinner's table. When I finally start to get mad and he puffs his lips, he goes, just like my son does. <laughs> and I'm like, it, it was just so natural. There was no dishonesty in what he did. And I'm telling you, I'm just so proud of both those guys. I mean, just incredible. I'm, you couldn't have hired a, an actor that was trained. Actually, some actors get in their head too much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But, but both those guys, man, Mike sometimes well, what was asking me during, you know, questions about this or that. And, uh, you, you know, how am I doing? I'm like, bro, you're, you're making me look really good. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, Mike was much more experienced, man, you know, and it's, even though I'd done some film before, that was a lead role in a full length film. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. to, to really convey those different emotions and then to play a father, pastor, policeman. It, it wasn't easy. It was not easy. Especially since I wasn't a father back then either. Oh, David, could I say one more thing? I don't know who was in charge of the schedule, but I'm so glad you allowed me and Mike to get to know each other before that scene because a lot of my emotion came from replacing the real Mike in my heart. What if I had really hurt Mike with the character? It was, it went hand in hand. When I told Mike, I was sorry what I said in the car. I mean, if we had done that scene like the second day, mm -hmm. I don't know if it would have came up, but I, we got, as you know, you had to tear us apart all the time, laughing and giggling. <laughs> and making up our own stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. It, it was just right. It was the right time to do that scene. So anybody else uh, have a say. favorite scene in the movie? Uh, David, Rob, Cindy? I, I'd like to say that my favorite scene is the last scene. And I won't, I won't uh, divulge any spoilers here, but I can remember standing and watching that final scene in a church packed with about a hundred people who'd been there maybe all day long, literally out in a hot sanctuary in, in, in a church here in town. And uh, I was holding my, my wife's hand and it was, it was a moment where Michael Joyner was going to cry. And I did not know if Michael Joyner could pull it off. We had no idea what was going to happen. I remember turning to my wife and our screenwriter and everyone was gathered around a monitor saying, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. And I was so blown away and then in tears, just seeing how God moved through 
through Michael Joyner uh, during that scene. I mean, it was so powerful. And I would love to go back to that moment and relive that and feel what I felt at that moment, just how awesome it was and how what he brought to that final scene yes. that everyone needs to watch. But words can't describe it. Well, it's David's lack of, lack of uh, what do you call it? He just let me do what I want. He didn't put no pressure. If he would have come in here and said, look, man, you got to make me look good in this scene. <laughs> I, would have been in, I would have been in trouble, <laughs> but he didn't. He just said, are you ready? And blah, blah, blah. And it, you know, when, when a direct, I hear that Clint Eastwood does the same thing. He talks to the actors and then lets them do their thing. And so that's just some really great directing, you know? Yeah, you got to trust your, you got to trust your actors. And the whole movie, honestly, depending on that moment, yeah. on that moment, it would not have had the same effect if you weren't able to do what you did in that moment. Hands down. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it was a great scene. It yeah. was. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Hey, you uh, want to hear a side story of when I got mad at Chris? Come on, let's make this, let's make this a little fun. Uh, sure, but first, uh, <laughs> but before we do that, uh, Cindy, Rob, do either of you, I, I just want to give them a chance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cindy, That's Rob, do either of you have a favorite scene in the film? No, I mean, I agree with them. Those were great scenes. I mean, as far as for me personally, um, it was, I, I didn't realize my scene with Rob and tossing that can of soda at him was mm. going to be so poignant. But when we began to show it, um, you know, in the preliminary showings to audiences and getting their reaction from it before it hit theaters, people loved that scene and I thought man they really loved the counselor shutting down that sassy mouth teenager they yeah. loved that. Yeah. it was it was hilarious to listen to the audience reaction but what but I loved the scene where we're talking it's like this it's the second or third counselor scene but I deliver a line to him where Do where Dr. Vine says um it's um, it's not about well rats. Now the line has dropped from my head. Um, Is it the it one that says it doesn't take a man to? Yeah, to fight. It doesn't take a man to fight, Blake. Right. It takes a man to reach out his hand, and it's such a poignant uh, line for the film, and and for you know Michael Joyner's character, for the Mac character, and um, and and for the whole thing, the whole theme of the film, and I loved being able to deliver a line with that much meat and that much poignancy. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just, I, I loved that one too, for me personally, so, but. Rob, do you have anything to add? Uh, just that, you know, as Cindy was talking, I didn't have any really acting experience coming into this and it made it so easy. She was so convincing as a counselor. Mm -hmm. that off. In the same way, Michael Joyner was a very convincing poor father. <laughs> so it made it very easy uh, just yeah. to react to how he was conducting himself yeah. and I'm glad that that came through on the screen <laughs> very nice very nice okay now Mike, uh, Michael Joyner what were you going to what was the story you were going to tell I just wanted to finish that round before what were you going to say no it had to do with that scene that's why I was saying that but me and Chris were me and Chris were kind of becoming tight Chris is that kind of guy you get to know him so we were we were having fun in between you know the day before whatever for whatever reason i was gravitating towards chris i've always had bad taste but anyway <laughs> um <laughs> so i do that scene i did that scene and chris came up and kind of said a little joke in my ear okay he said a little joke in my ear as i was and there's certain scenes you can joke and there's other ones like where i gotta stay in that i went up yeah. to chris i said you ever as I was coming up to him, he goes, I know, I know, I shouldn't have said <laughs> I said, you ever do that again? <laughs> that was our only, that was our only serious moment. But other than that, it was all cool. And let, me, right. let, me, say, let me say this real quick, and then I, uh, I know you'll need to move on. But as far as okay. scenes go, the one with me and Michael back in the hallway after I tell them, you know, they're yes. going to be working together. And he's like, a moment, sir, and we go in the hall. The, the intensity of that, Michael helped me so much with that. And the thing where I said, hey, that's got nothing to do with it. That just happened because he was like pushing me. And I think that was so intense because I was playing it down. And then he was like, 
he was like really pushing me. And so I had that pad in my hand and I, he brought up race. I was like, Hey, that's got nothing to do. That was just, I mm. think, I thank him for helping me. Because even though he's being mean to me right now, uh, I want to be show love to him. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I have a question here. Um, uh, Dave, you can chime in on this as well if, you, if you'd like. Uh, this is actually one of the questions I asked when you guys were at ENC, but to be honest with you, I forgot what you told me. Um, uh, one of the, lots of times when you see um, movies, particularly ones that are shot in Hollywood, and they do behind the scenes and they're like a movie about law enforcement or some kind of first responders, Usually the cast has gone through some kind of training to make sure, and I don't want to name names here, but there have been some Christian films that have tried to do action or law enforcement and they just don't get it right. You just don't buy that the people are really law enforcement. And I told, I, every moment that uh, Michael, Michael, and even Chris are in uniform, I, 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 ne I never had trouble buying it for a second. You guys pulled up, pulled out real quickly. Did you have any like, Police consultants? Did Michael and Michael go through any training for this? What would I was hoping you guys could speak to that a little bit? We did have police consultants. What was the guy's name? Vander or something? I remember him being on the yeah, set. Yeah, Scott Van Zandt graduated with me. That was his name. I remember Scott was there. Red hair. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then um, we just had the full cooperation with everything. It's funny. It wasn't just the church that, that got behind it, it was the the city of Memphis. I remember yeah. like, yeah, it was, everybody was behind it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna let David talk about it because he knows better than anyone, I'm sure. David? Well, we had Dog the Bounty Hunter on set the first five <laughs> <laughs> Almost on making an arrest properly. And uh, oh, we did have a couple consultants and the police director <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I said that. But uh, but to Michael John, I didn't say it. I'm just trying to be funny. But uh, we did have some great support from the city police department, and basically they gave us everything we wanted. And and without their support, uh, you know, the cars, the police precinct, um, you know, so so they were willing to help us along the way. And and, and Michael is right. We did have an excellent consultant with us from uh, the police department who was there, not only kind of like for security, but also as an advisor kind of helping us if someone wasn't doing something per their normal protocol, they would let us know. But outside of that, um, we didn't have the liberty of sending our actors to, away to some yeah. police department for <clears throat> an ideal, but they did awesome. They didn't need that. And uh, mm -hmm. I believe it. I agree with Chris. It was very believable. Chris, you were going to try in there? I was David, I think I was told that that is the first time mm -hmm. in Memphis history that the Memphis Police Department had allowed the Memphis Police Department to be used, the name Memphis Police Department, and the, the equipment, the uniforms, everything, and Director Godwin was a big part of that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's another God thing, but I just remember that, hearing about that. Yeah. yeah. That was another thing. So those were actual... Memphis PD uniforms you guys were wearing then. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, like, again, not naming names, and it doesn't even have to be Christian films. There's been some independent films where, like, you know, two police officers come in and they look like they're wearing something from Goodwill. You know what I mean? You can tell it's, like, security uniforms they tried to make look like policeman uniforms. But you guys, you guys look like real cops. That's one of the reasons why. And another thing that I should mention is, you know, I said earlier in the roundtable, I had said to a colleague of mine, I wish somebody would make a decent Christian film about cops. Well, that's one of the things that I think kind of like sets this movie aside a little bit. One could argue it's a cop movie, but I think a better thing would say it's a movie about people, some of who happen to be law enforcement, I think would be a better way to put it. I mean, because your average cop movie has like a villain or whatever. In some ways, one could argue Mac is almost the antagonist of the film, or at least for the most part, for a good portion of the film he is, and he's one of the policemen. So it really doesn't. So, so even though on one hand you could say it's a cop movie, and on the other hand it really doesn't follow the formula of the cop movie genre, which is yet another reason why I like the film. So, uh, let me see. What do I have? You know what's funny is <laughs> you guys have said so many great stories. You've kind of actually walked into some of the other questions I already had prepared. Uh, so, I'll, but I'll I'll mention this uh, just real, real quickly here. Now, th this is kind of a this is kind of a throwaway question. Um, uh, David, really quickly, this was something that always dawned on me. I, I would say 
maybe about 50% of this film, and it's, it's great, about, I'd say about half this film, are Joyner and Higginbottom talking to each other, whether it's in a car, whether it's on patrol, whether it's the great church scene. And you got two leads who share the same first name. That never got confusing. You never had to like clarify who you were talking to. All the time. It did. It did. Okay. <laughs> didn't you? Didn't you eventually say one will be Mike and one will be Michael? Eventually. Yeah, and and a lot. Of and he starts saying Higginbottom too. The Higginbottom or, or Joiner. He, he started doing that a lot. I think yeah. David finally said cracker, and I would respond. <laughs> Oh, I wondered yeah. if one of you was going to go there, to be honest with you. I wondered. <laughs> I, can't, I can't leave this thing without giving something, man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. But I mean, me and, Mike, me and Mike, that's all we did in the car was joke like that. And that's, that's what made our relationship believable. Yeah. I mean, the movie was based about it. So we could, it, it's hard not to bring it yeah. in, you know, to yeah. really discuss exactly. certain things and lines and the man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, you kind of already mentioned this, David, but the, the question was going to be like, you know, what, what, since most of the movie was Michael and Michael, what, 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 the chemistry between them is just so great. I mean, that must, that must have been great, great working with, with them. I mean, was, is there anything you want to add time. to the process? We, we, we had, like uh, Big at Bottom just said, we had a great time. I have great memories. Um, they just, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly no one to coach these guys as far as their performance. They just brought it. Like Michael Higginbottom said, he was working full time, you know, during the making of this movie. Oh, and, boy. You know, and, yeah, it really is. And, uh, and it just, it was just incredible. I mean, we could go on for hours talking about that, but I just always pause and say, thank you, God, for doing what you did over that, over those 30 days, because mm -hmm. without him, these pieces would not have fallen into place. Yeah, and really. Really. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say yeah. something, and that's about Cindy's performance. And some of you may not know this story, but <laughs> a couple of years after the Grace Card was released, I got a call at my office from it was like the Counseling Centers of America or something. <laughs> <a> conference. <laughs> yeah. How they could track down the counselor from the Grace <laughs> Card because they wanted her to come and speak to the other counselors wow. at the conference. And I said, Well, She's over at a local car dealership, uh, you know, in the finance department. You'll have to find her there. But uh, they, they <laughs> refused to believe that she was not a true counselor in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, but so she does have a little counseling center opened up now. If you guys, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be calling you soon. Anyway, yeah, she's excellent. Uh, I'll be seeing her after this for my. Uh, oh. <laughs> Now, um, this next question that I have here, uh, Cindy, I'm going to include you in this. You'll have to forgive me, Cindy. I, did, I had written these talking points up before uh, we found well, out that you were going to be here. But um, one of the things, this particular, uh, Rob, this specifically, go, specifically goes to you real quickly here. You know, Joyner over here, I've actually taken his online acting course. Never met him in person, but I've taken his online acting course. He was on my first round table. Watched a lot of his comedy routines. They've, done, they've gone to his Facebook uh, prayer streams. But... Uh, Michael Joyner, you're a very nice guy, but I would not want you mad at me. Let's put it that way. You, you are a person I would not want mad at me. And so I just, I'm, I'm wondering those scenes where you, and I'd say probably like, there's like two or three scenes where you guys are just blowing up at each other. You know what I mean? And I just, was that exhausting, nerve wracking? And then, you know, Cindy, Cindy mentioned the scene where you throw the, the can to him. I mean, th those are both very like high energy, nerve wracking scenes. Every, every time I show a friend this movie and I watch it with them, I am watching it vicariously through them again, like I'm seeing it for the first time. Hmm. And so I just, uh, you know, I just, I, and you know, Rob, you said that you, that uh, you hadn't done much acting prior to this. So, I mean, what, what was that, what was that like having God smart, having to yell it out with God smart, Alec? <laughs> so if my performance came off at all, it was because of the coaching from Cindy, from Mike and Mike, from David, from Howie, from a few people from church, like uh, George Bradshaw, uh, yeah. specifically. Um, so, and, and Mike said earlier that one of the things that David did to make it easy on him on some of the scenes he had was not to have any expectations. Mm -hmm. And Mike made it easy to, to play off of him. We talked about that for a long time. 
there were many, many, many takes. Uh, and it was tense. It was tense to, to have to try to find that place. Uh, but in the, in the interims, uh, I did get to enjoy the comedic stylings of God's smart out. <laughs> so it, it, it did, it was a nice balance. Uh, uh, to draw on his experience uh, as an actor and really find that place, but then to be able to come out of it so that you could attack it again fresh for the next take. Mm-hmm. And then with Cindy, yeah, I, whatever she brought into that, into that room, into that scene, uh, just did it for out of that place where I was sitting with uh, a counselor trying to dissect me and I was not about it. <laughs> so I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with both of them. Both, they were tense scenes, but it was satisfying to be in there. It really took me into the moment and into the part. You know, that night that I had Michael and Michael do the uh, Skype Q&A, I was showing the group, I was showing um, the movie to like three of my friends, uh, uh, two of who are kind of lukewarm believers and one of who I know is not. And uh, th- that they really loved that scene, Cindy, where you put Robert in his place. For the record, they were like, they were, so there, so so that so it really struck it really struck a chord with them. There were some there were some other th- things as well. David, I will say this: you kind of went some places with this film that other Christian films are afraid to go, which is one of the reasons why I think the movie is so odd. I mean, the fact that you have Joyner come this close to dropping the N word, for example, that guy. Every time yeah. I watch. Every time I watch the movie with a new audience, I'm just waiting for all the air to be sucked out of the room the moment that that happens. Because everybody's yeah. just like, oh! <laughs> and, <laughs> so, anyway. So, sorry, forget, I, I know what Mike is laughing at, and I ain't going to tell. <laughs> I'm not going to oh, tell. <laughs> what, is there an outtake where he actually said it or something? <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I said you. I'm not going to tell. Yeah, well, Chris, well, Chris's not... head nod just kind of confirmed it. Man. Oh, I'm sorry. My neck's bothering me. Of course, of course Rob, <laughs> Rob, says the, Rob says the pseudo F word in the film. That was something else. So. <laughs> Does he? Oh, yeah. that's right. I forgot. Yeah. There, yeah. So, all right. Let's see what else we have here. You know, you touched on this a little bit, um, but I, I remember some of you telling me in the past that there were some moments, like, uh, Michael, I think you said this during the Skype q and I did a couple months ago. That one of the which, lines. Which Michael? Thank you for clarifying. Joiner, Joiner, yeah. uh, Joiner. I think Joiner uh, said this a couple of months ago when I was doing the uh, Skype Q and A with the two of you and my friends. You said that the um, scene, like for example, where you're talking about the uh, recreational device you find in Blake's room, came from your name was an ad libbed line. Uh, were there any other moments that were kind, that made it into the film that were off the cuff or not scripted? Yeah. I yeah, mean, I've been ad libbing as a comedian for a long. <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought you were asking. I'm sorry. Did you do that too? Well, no. I mean, I. Sorry, sorry. Yes, he probably. I'm sure he was asking you, Michael. Well, actually, I, I was kind of asking in. everybody. I was kind of. At, I'm sorry. I should have clarified. Mike told me that that moment was oh, improvised. Was there? Was there any I other thought, moments for anybody? Can jump in here. Was there, Was there any other moments that were like off the cuff, like spur of the moment that were that was let's not? Let's send like you tell her story because I didn't hear. It. Well, I mean, it wasn't let's a, a huge. Her story. Yeah, it wasn't a huge thing. Um, For example, when uh, I was in one of my scenes where I was praying over Blake in the hospital room, uh, Rob's character, um, uh, David had said, we need you to pray for him. It's not scripted. Just go in and do it. And so we did. (laughs) So I went in and he said, action. And I picked up Rob's hand and I just prayed over him. And so uh, it, it was off the cuff. But it worked, and um, and so yeah. I mean, there's just moments like that. But I know you're probably looking for more funny stories. <laughs> oh no, no, it's fine. No, no, I'm looking for I'm looking for anything here, really. So, Mike, didn't we ad lib the scene? We ad libbed a lot. The one thing that David let me keep, let us keep yeah. that I liked was when I well, there's one with me and you, but the first one was. They talk about the neighbors. I said, David, let me have an ad lib here. I think it'll establish my character as a racist. They said, go ahead. So after Rob leaves, and I'm talking about the pot. I said, he probably got it from those new neighbors. Right. So they kept that. Yeah. But then me and yeah. Mike, what, which one did we, what's, what's the, we had several, Michael. What's the one you were going to say? I, I was just remembering like the scene when I went to go uh, 
give up the kidney or whatever. And we did that in the hospital with like the fist bump on the chest and like the hand up. I think we ad libbed that. And I love that did scene. Mm. I think and so. Dave, did, did you write that? <laughs> did you? I, think, I, think I thought we, we did. I thought we did. Something that yeah, was cool. Worked really good. I yeah. love that whole thing in the montage, and so I didn't oh, want yeah. to say because it yeah. gives away. But with the and song, they, could, they couldn't it, have picked this. They couldn't have picked the song that gets the tear jerking more. Oh, yeah. it was yeah. fabulous! I yeah. love that whole scene. It was great. And then they replay it at the end during the big moment that we can't tell people about. But, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um. Actually, okay. Now here's something actually kind of interesting. Here, I have David Michael Higginbottom. You guys probably will not remember this. But when you guys were at Eastern Nazarene College, where I saw you guys for the first time, this is the exact, when you guys were doing the panel Q&A with the audience, this is the exact same question I asked you both back then. And I'm going to ask you again now, okay? How did, David, how did you get Lou Gossett Jr. in the film? And Michael Higginbottom, what was it like working with him? Because I looked over the movie, you're the only one who did any scenes with him. So what mm -hmm. was it, so what was, so uh, how did you get him in the movie, David? And Michael Higginbottom, what was it like working with him? So, we uh, had auditioned many people for the role of, of uh, uh, Sam's grandfather. Uh, the, His name uh, was George. George, yeah. And we auditioned so many people for George in the, in the movie, Grandpa George, and could yeah. not find anyone. And I was literally just combing through the various databases online. First, I, I always go to, I always Google Christian actors, and it's a very short list. Hmm. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I just started thinking, and, and as Michael said earlier, we, we thought about Robert Guillaume, and eventually I started thinking about Lou Gossett, and my, I still remember my wife was cooking something on the stove, and she said, oh, yeah, right, like Lou Gossett's going to come to Memphis for the crazy part, <laughs> and one thing led to another, and I was able to come across his, uh, his, his uh, agent's name and phone number. He really wouldn't give me the time of the day, uh, the time of day, but he said, "Look, get me the script. I'll get it to him." Because Lou Gossett has a nonprofit foundation called Eracism, uh, racism with an E on the front of it, yeah. and uh, literally within a few days, uh, they were calling back, and he was interested. So, uh, uh, so I walked in the next day. My wife was cooking. I said, "Guess what?" No, not really, but uh, anyway, <laughs> just really amazing how it all came to place. And uh, again. Going back to what I've said a couple of times already, we just give God the glory for opening that door. Yeah. yeah. Um, in regards to how was it working with him? I mean, he, um, I remember prior to us actually the filming our scene together, he said he wanted to meet me first. And I went to his, hot, his hotel room and I think really it was smart of him to kind of do that. Cause when you think about working with an Oscar, you know, winner, right? I was, it was a little intimidation. So just meeting him there, guy had his shoes and socks off and feet looked like my grandpa's and looking <laughs> at his face. And, I mean, seriously, he was just, he was just relatable. And it just took away any type of um, anxiety I might've had about acting with him. And then, you know, the day of, you know, we, we talked and he, Cracked the joke. <laughs> I remember that. And it, I mean, it, it was cool. I mean, he, he, he gave me some encouragement, you know, after I did it. I'm like, how's that? He was like, man, that was phenomenal. You know, try this, you know? And I remember one note that he gave me was when we're doing our walking scene along uh, the river. I walked off when he yelled cut the first time. I kind of followed him out, out of, you know, out of frame. And he said, no, that's your moment. You stay there in frame and take that moment. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, all right. And that's something that I've learned since then, you know, and did it again. We did, the, you know, another take of it. And it's, it's a quick moment, but, it, you know, he, he taught me, you know, so I appreciate it. God. For the record, I did try to reach out to him for this, but the problem is people like him have got so many people impersonating him online that it's hard to find, it's hard to find the real one. <laughs> yes, Chris. Can I ask a quick question to David because of Michael and Lou's scenes together? Was that all scripted because, man, it was the, the library scene and walking yeah. down the river scene was so moving. I mean, 
was that all? Here's exactly what you say. Because, man, no, Dave. Awesome. I'll say, I'll say, <laughs> much of it wasn't for it, but Lou would kind of go off on a few little tangents and kind of <laughs> rewrite a few things here and there. So, so I have yeah. to say, not all scripted, especially in the library scene. Uh, you know, we had, we ran into some into some challenges there. Just uh, it was a very smoky environment, and and Lou was not in the best of health then. And uh, just, but hey, again, he, he did an incredible job. He brought in a few ideas. The- <laughs> no, David, <laughs> he did not stay on script at all. At all. Yeah. And that made it a little difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. It was great. If you look real close, you could see Mike had his script in his hand the whole time. <laughs> he finally threw it away. <laughs> the whole film. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Speaking, speaking of having things, uh, forgive me, this is going to make me look so historically illiterate, but I couldn't figure out any way to figure this out. What's the picture Lou Gossett Jr. hands Michael in that scene? He handed me a picture? What? A, a hmm. picture of somebody from the... You know, no, he says yeah, it was um, a picture when he goes, you can never underestimate the power of Grace Boy, and he hands it to you. And I could not for the that's, life of that's, that's the actual Grace card he hands me. Yeah, he says that. No, not the page. No, he, he hands you a photograph at the end of the scene. Oh, was it when um, his. Uh, uh, it, it, it was his. He was talking about the. Uh, yeah, his grandfather, and the, he worked for a slave owner yeah. who, yeah. after he released. The slaves, a lot of them went back and worked for them. Yes. Yeah. So there it was, was like a, a, there was like a picture of a of a city that he hands you at the very end of the scene, and I couldn't figure out what it was. Watch the movie real quick and see because I don't remember that one. <laughs> no, it wasn't a. a, a um, Thing is, I can't pull the movie up on my phone here because I ha- because uh, I don't I have the I have my internet plugged right into my laptop for this. So I got to go. I'm pretty sure it, it's something we got from like. Uh, some um, historical group here in Memphis, and it had to right. do with uh, a, uh, yeah. a strike or a protest of some kind. Similar. That's what it looked like. I just couldn't figure out if it was something we were supposed to recognize or not. Something. So I just. Clear. That's why I said. But that was at the beginning of the scene or at the end of the scene. It was at the end of the scene. Trust me, I've watched this thing more times than I can count. Hey. You guys were there. You guys were there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. All right. Watch uh, it tonight. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, oh, w- one thing that I thought of here, uh, you know, you mentioned this several times when I first when I was at the Q and A at ENC, and you mentioned it several times here. You know that pretty much everybody was involved in this. You know, had a day job and you had to shoot with them. I noticed there's a good show. now. We kind of already have given away that something happens to Rob's character uh, in the movie, and uh, that occurs during night. So there's like a chunk of the movie right in the middle that is all night, and I was wondering was doing was doing all that night shooting a challenge. Yeah. It was. Well, because again, Michael, I know Michael Higginbottom didn't even sleep. A couple of times I made him sleep. I said, go on the hospital bed and take a nap. I'll come get you when they shoot. He didn't even want to sleep. He had no complaints, but he just, so I know it was really hard on him because it was already yeah, hard I, on me. It's, it's I was a working tough time for, to shoot. Uh, I was working a aviation sales job at the time and I would have to be at work at 8 a.m. and I was working at 5 p.m. And I would leave work at 5 p.m. and have to be at set at like 5.30. And we would shoot till, it was days, I mean, we had to shoot the film in 30 days. So it was days like those night shoots. We'd be there till what, 2.30? Yeah, three. <laughs> Yeah, and then had to wake up the next morning, be at work at eight a.m., and then do it again. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was uh, it was challenging. But you know what? When you're doing something that is ordained and just yeah, and such a part of who you are, it made that it made it easier. You I was looking forward. You know, if anything, I was like, oh my gosh, please work in so I can go to the film. You know. Mm-hmm. Which is why I'm out in LA now. I couldn't wait to leave that job, and I was like, "Man, that was my chance," you know. So there it is. I don't know what happened to Chris. We seem to have lost Chris. I don't know if he got a phone call or what. We he lost might have met a girl. Long time. He might have <laughs> met a girl on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, Chris, we hope that you're. Okay. We hope everything is all right over there. 
Okay. It's the first time I've ever lost a panelist during a round. Oh, he's there back. He there you are. Yes. There you are. Everything okay, Chris? You're you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> what? I'm older now and have to go potty more than I used to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This might be the first one I send to my friend for editing. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, you have uh, actually. Long. Yeah. Actually, I only have one. More. I actually only have one more question here. And um, I think it goes without saying, one of the reasons why, why I think that, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is because, you know, this movie was made back in 2011, but I, in my opinion, there is no Christian film that exists that is more still relevant today with everything yeah. that is going on. Yeah. And uh, so I just want, I just want to, I just want to ask, you know, th this, this might be kind of an obvious question, but uh, what it, and you can each answer this, what do you hope everybody gets out of watching this film? I mean, might be an obvious answer, but if you if you want anybody to take one thing away from watching the race car, what would it be? Go ahead, Chris. To the, to the least important person in the film, speak first. Um, <laughs> that'd be me. No, because I want to. I mean, I want to hear everyone's take on this. But because I spent 23 years as an elected official here, and have been seen a lot. But my thing is, is that we need to love all people. But when I pe when people watch this movie, to me, mm -hmm. what I want them to take away from it is. We need to love all people the way Christ did and still does, no matter what they look like. Even I have friends that are Muslim, but I still love them. I may not agree with their faith, right. but we need to start bringing back that Christ love across the board. And David, I want to tell you, seriously, like he said earlier, this movie, the topic was, I think it was ahead of its time. I mean, I'm just, and I know God's in control and all that. I got that. And my point is, with what's going on today, we need to just show Christ's love to everyone and respect everyone. And that's just, that's just me. And that's just where I'm at. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. Anybody else? Yeah, well, I want to say, I, I continue to see on Amazon or uh, wherever people can post their opinions. Or we recently showed the movie at a church and I spoke afterwards in, in Iowa. And people, the message of forgiveness is so powerful. People's lives are incredibly changed. If you go on Amazon or wherever people have posted about the movie, and if you're on Facebook, the memories come up also. And, and whenever there, it's the time of year where the grace card was shown. There's people talking about how their lives were changed. They couldn't forgive someone until they saw this movie. So I got to admit, I've not seen a lot of Christian movies where I thought personally, you know, God can use that message. It was okay, but I've never seen something like the grace card where pe people's lives are so affected. And it's not just within the subject of race, although it is. I don't know if you guys remember this, but several times when you showed the movie before it came out in Memphis, there was silence at the end of the film and you would look in the audience and black folks and white folks were hugging each other without saying anything. That's how powerful the movie is. But the movie goes beyond just race relations. Everybody who needs to forgive anybody watches this movie and their life has changed. So I just want to see God, and that's in other countries. I've, I've gotten people from uh, South America tell me how much this has changed their life. So yeah, it was yeah, definitely an anointed movie. Just a great movie that got, it's, it's the epitome of a Christian film, in my opinion. Exactly. That's the best I can tell. Yes. Anybody else have anything to say? I think that, um, uh, boy, it, it really is an amazing anointing on the film and it is for any season at any time because whoever is watching it at that moment um the, you know the holy spirit just does something where he um um just can change a life and it's not just, I agree, it's not just the, the race relation category. It is in relationship area yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. between husband and wife, between 
father and son mm -hmm. between um and and at that moment whenever the person is watching it, it they take away uh things and ideas where where they can heal relationships be it between friends or or relatives or or again across the racial barrier lines it's just it's it's like no other christian film that's out there and yeah. it's going to span the test of time, I think. I really think that. And I really believe that God just anointed uh, the script for David and um, uh, caused David to really get it made, to get the film made. It's just, you can see the hand of God at different points all over it. And I, too, am thankful to be a part of it. Um, it's like nothing else I know of that's out there right now. So, I, I want to add to that. Um, I think one of the biggest things about it is, you know, of course you have the theme of forgiveness, right? But I think it's also just acceptance yeah. of yeah. differences, right? Because that was a common theme throughout it too. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's the acceptance of, of Michael's character and Rob's character, father and son, right? And the differences there or forgiveness and understanding of, of me right and my and that and i think that's what it, it what the biggest lesson is and i think that that's what people can learn right is that everybody that you meet is a product that they've either seen been taught or experienced right mm -hmm. and i think that when you have that acceptance then you can have that respect for that person that chris was talking about right because you know, it always bug, bugs me when people are like, oh, I, I look at a person, a black person or a white person, I don't see a color. That's the most ignorant thing that I think a person can <laughs> say, right? Because you you obviously see a color unless you're colorblind, right? right, right. And it's not a thing about uh, turning a blind eye away from that color, but in acceptance and, and uh, uh, wanting to know more about that, because that's the beauty of America, right? And of the world. Yes. It's, we all are, are of different races and backgrounds and experiences, and it's something to be learned. And I think that once people get past this, right, yeah. then you can have a, a better relationship and a better understanding, you know? So that's what I think that the movie does. It, it, it was beyond, it, it, the reason why Mike's character was the way he was, was because of his past and experience. Yeah. But taking the time to get to know my character and who I was, right? You, you see him at that moment. One of the better moments is when he finally laughs. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When yeah. he finally yeah. laughs. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> that's huge. You know, that's a breakthrough. And that's what we need is more big breakthroughs. Yes, but. indeed. Yes. Rob, David, you guys got anything to add? Well, I think like uh, Cindy said, it's a movie that, and, and, and Michael Joyner, it's a movie that was that ahead of its time. And mm. I think it needs to be opening in theaters nationwide this coming Friday, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our country yeah. race card right now. And I know of no other movie that exists that can demonstrate mm. it like, like you guys do in this film. So we have to pray strongly for, our, for every, all of these uh, folks who are out there on the streets tonight and protesting and and trying to uh, protect the streets it's a it's a tough time and and everyone needs to play the grace card right now mm. yeah well anyway Rob, just, did you go ahead i'll just say that uh a lot of theme of the the movie was forgiveness for things that had already occurred uh, if you watched uh, and paid close enough attention you saw each of the characters, uh, uh, Mike, Mike, and my character as well, bringing, uh, it's like they consider themselves the, uh, the only character and everybody else in their life was static, that they didn't bring their own stresses, their own problems into the interactions that occur throughout the day. And uh, if we all just, just took a moment to consider that we're each, uh, coming from a, a different place, but they were all people yeah. and kind of approach it with that, uh, that mm -hmm. respect, uh, any interaction that you have with that sort of respect. Uh, I can see that, you know, in this age of civil unrest, I can see that 
a, a large benefit to society. So that's what I would hope people would get out of it. Not just to forgive after the fact, but to, to commit to being friends uh, in the interim. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you all for being, being here tonight. It was a great, great pleasure to talk to you all. And since this is at the risk of looking like I'm segueing right into a commercial here, um, since this is a movie that we really could need, need more of, where would be, does anybody know the best place that people who watch, who might watch this round table? Take your hand off my face. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does anybody, anybody, uh, like for example, <laughs> David, would you know the uh, what would be the best place that people could look for this? Would it be Amazon or is Dollar there... Tree? <laughs> I saw one of the I comments on my get, last round table. Said I had the same to get, thing. I had to get David just one more time, man. He got me five times. <laughs> I, I, uh, Scott, I think. Uh, uh, um, Amazon or Christianbook.com, any 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 online Christian retailer should have it. If they don't, we'll 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 come and see them. And if there are five hundred boxes in my garage, <laughs> <laughs> David, well, I got to tell you something. I want to tell David one last thing. Okay, sure, David. I I started this thing, and man, it's beautiful. I got a video of it, where I because uh, I stop a lot when I travel as a comedian at the uh, truck stops and I see the movies that they try to sell these truckers yeah. Charles Bronson 1972 and so I started prayerfully giving away the grace card and people will watch a movie if you say I'm the I'm in this movie I'm one of the stars of this movie yeah. and it's really been a wonderful thing man and it's just a nice little ministry that I started I don't know if you've seen the video but I'll show it to you I want to see that yeah, yeah. Oh, and if you go to any of those websites that uh, David mentioned, there's a chance you might uh, run into this little film here as well. Um, there's yeah. another good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, I, I mean this I, in the nicest possible way, but I think you're the very first director who I can hold the entire resume in my hands. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He's an amazing director. You already mentioned that Cindy is in that movie. Someone else. Michael. Almost, Michael Higginbottom. Two other people, two other pe and one other person makes an appearance as well. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, I forgot barely, you were there barely, as well. barely I made it, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, um, you can go to Stars, and it will show me and Lou Gossett Jr. as the star of the movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you pull it up on On Demand, that's, uh, he's right. I checked it out. I don't really? know. I don't know what happened. Speaking of, mo great, speaking of movies, crazy out there, yeah, but, speaking yeah. of movies, two other quick things here. I think some of you, I know Cindy, I sent this to you. I, you know, the guests who come on this thing, it's great. One thing that I, I really, unfortunately, you know, can't give people much for uh, appearing on here. I thank you for uh, coming on here, but I always, I, all of my panelists, I think some of you might have this already. Like I think uh, Higginbottom and Joyner both do, and I sent one to Cindy. This is the only film I ever wrote, a uh, film called The Reconciler with uh, Roddy Roddy Piper. It was his last film. If uh, anybody would like a copy of this for being, if you don't have one already, I let all my guests know if you want a copy of The Reconciler, I will send you one free of charge. I just need an address to send it to. So thank you very much there. And uh, one last and final thing here. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of this whole thing, you know, that uh, Joyner was, is a stand-up comedian and Higginbottom occasionally does hip hop and I wasn't going to put them on the spot. However, if any of our viewers would like to see or hear either of those things, is there any place that um, someone watching this could get their hands on uh, Joyner's comedy or Higginbottom's music? I have a couple things on YouTube, I but okay. I don't, I, nothing that I really uh, okay. I thought promote you like that. Spoken word on Spotify, Mike. Mike yeah, you I know. Right? Spoken word on Spotify, man. Yeah, I might do that. I actually am working on some uh, some new stuff right now. Actually, guys, I think that you guys really like it, so we'll see. All right, and yeah. uh, Joiner, I believe you have. Don't you have like a comedy album out that came out within the past couple months? Yeah, my new uh, my. CD Shut Up and Laugh is on uh, spot. It's on all the platforms, Spotify. And uh, of course, since the COVID, I had to get a regular job. I had a regular job actually today, but I am not going back to that job after what my boss said. You know what he said? What? You're fired. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known a, a punchline was coming there. <laughs> that's a good one. Hey, I will tell you that other than Michael Joyner's comedy, yeah. He hasn't been 
a very good role in several other faith-based films that I've yes. watched. And so nice. TV and check both these guys out, including a little film called hey, Joiner. Michael yeah. Joiner, you worked on a film with a friend of mine uh, that was in the army with this guy, a guy named Rob. Rob Creighton. Was Robert the, Creighton. Was it a zombie movie? I don't know. I think it was My Name is Paul or, or, or something. Was that my it? My Name is Paul. Yeah. His name is Robert Creighton. Uh, when, cool. did, when did I talk to him? I don't know. I just I saw the credits and I saw his name in the credits and he was a guy from New York that was in that film, I believe it was, with you. Yeah, I, uh, Rob somebody? He Rob? was a star. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah, yeah, like, okay. long hair. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Michael was also cool. in a movie. Michael was also in Michael Jordan was also in a movie called Out of the Darkness, which was uh, directed by my friend Sean Justice, who also directed Reconciler. So there it's it is. Small, it's a small world. <laughs> I've also done one called The Miseducation of Joy. If you guys get a chance, take a look at it. Let's go. We'll, do. we'll, do. well thank you once again, all of you, for being here. Thank you for everybody who is watching, and uh, please check out the Grace Card. So long, everyone. <laughs>